All right. Ready to go? Okay. What's the energy, guys? Come on, bring it up, bring it up. Okay, the after party. Well, uh, thanks a lot for everyone, uh, to everyone for making it to the presentation on Friday morning. My name is Dan Banga. I do lead a team of business development managers at um, Amazon Web Services. Uh, focusing on machine learning and deep learning platforms and services, specifically SageMaker and the ecosystem of products that come around it. Uh, it's my pleasure to present um, alongside Facebook today, uh, my friend Jeff Smith from Facebook AI Research. Um, and the goal of today is to talk to you in, in depth and details about the PyTorch, the experience of a developer uh, as, it, as it comes to PyTorch on, on the cloud, on SageMaker. Uh, just for a little bit of housekeeping, um, there will be code. We will be showing some code, but don't worry about all the details because, as a matter of fact, the code are available. The code is available on GitHub. Um, so, just what what we want to focus on today is the best practices, some of the insights that we can share right now, so that you, you at least get that. You at least take that home, and uh, the details are available online for you to read. Um, okay. Also, this is a 400 level session. We won't be doing, going through a lot of definitions, um, but again, everything is available to read online and um, the, the code is heavily documented for, for, for your benefit. Okay, so I, I'd like to get this started by walking you through some of the 10, top 10 strategic uh, trends in technology for 2019. As you all know, we, we're walking towards a world of autonomous things and immersive experience in blockchain. As you might have seen, there are a tons, tons of these net new technologies that are coming and impacting our world. And I believe you're all here today because you understand the impact that um, AI has over the world that we are all going to be in today, uh, tomorrow. Um, but particularly, some of the things that caught my attention when I was looking at these uh, changes are things like uh, digital ethics and privacy, or smart spaces, or AI-driven development. And those are practical aspects of using deep learning and AI to make, essentially, the experience better when it comes to AI-driven development for developers and data scientists, but as well as the experience better when it comes to humanity in general. So we're seeing all these trends coming up and we're seeing AI involved in all of these. And at AWS specifically, we're seeing tens of thousands of developers actively building machine learning models on the cloud today. Uh, so much so that there's a 250% growth year over year. Uh, and then this is mostly um, enabled by the, the, the speed at which these developers and data scientists can build, train, and tune machine learning models in the cloud. So part of what we do with SageMaker and the other products and services is to accelerate the process that someone has to go through from ideation to realization as far as their project is concerned when it comes to machine learning. And eight out of 10 of TensorFlow workloads that we're observing nowadays is running on AWS, including the benchmark. Now, we're working with tons and tons of customers um, a lot of them you might, you might know. If you're using um, a ZocDoc to go to the doctor, for example, you're probably using TensorFlow and AWS. You are using TensorFlow and AWS in the back end. Uh, Digital Globe is using uh, CHMaker to analyze large images um, and, and then provide those large images and insights on those large images to their own customers as a service. So we're seeing a, a heavy momentum going towards um, leveraging machine learning on the cloud today. And in sports analytics as well, um, some of the fun examples are folks like the NFL essentially ingesting terabytes of data into the cloud and leveraging Amazon SageMaker to transform their experience that uh, some of their customers have when it comes to the game. We're seeing similar dynamics in sports analytics with Formula One essentially ingesting terabytes of data through the cars uh, during a race and then using machine learning on SageMaker to transform their experience, the visual experience that the folks that are watching uh, the races are having. So our approach at AWS to enable all of these capabilities and all these accelerations is to essentially start by being customer focused. 90 to 95 percent of our roadmap is driven by the feedback that we get from customers. Uh, we are aggressive at the pace at which we innovate. 
Uh, if you observe the keynotes and all the launches that we announced lately, you, you, this might not be a, a surprise to you. Um, and we also focus on the breadth and the depth at the same time. There's more AI and machine learning services in production at AWS than anywhere else. And because we're aggressively listening to what our customers are asking for, we're essentially building anything that they're asking for, anything that is popular. We support every framework, or the most popular framework that exists nowadays, PyTorch, TensorFlow, MXNet, Cafe, you name it. Uh, and then we package all of this with, within a secured environment, and we embed research and development into everything that we do. For example, in SageMaker, we provide algorithms that are coming from the research that we do at Amazon.com, and we make them available for our customers to consume. So now let's jump into the developer's experience. Um, today, as a developer, you're probably working with, I mean, by developer, I mean data scientist and AI engineer developer. You're probably partnering with a DevOps engineer or someone that owns the infrastructure, and you're working together to essentially put your products in production, right? So you build your AI models, you using things like Jupyter Notebook, and then you have to hand that over to the DevOps person to put that in production. What I want to challenge all of us today to think about is this concept of AI-driven development where you're working on an integrated workflow, integrated AI application development workflow, that involves a few things. One of them is the AI developer's tool. As a developer, what kind of SDK, what kind of tool would you require in order to build AI models? The second thing that comes in, in the picture is, of course, the algorithms, because you, as an AI developer, again, you want to use the tools that make your life easier, but you also want to build some algorithms. What if some of these algorithms were already figured out by folks like us and made available to you in order for you to pick them up and then use that directly? Or what if the same environment would be able to provide you the ability to bring your own algorithm in PyTorch or another uh, 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 framework language? And the third thing is an end-to-end -end machine learning platform that is fully integrated with the developer tools and then the, the algorithm, and that's where SageMaker comes in the picture. And the fourth thing is, of course, the model templates and packages and SDK and everything that we can templatize to make sure that the experience that you have is reproducible and repeatable. And so that's why SageMaker and PyTorch are really nicely combined to essentially make sure that the developer's experience is, is as easy as possible. And we're going to jump into the details right now. I believe, who here is not familiar with SageMaker? Pretty much no one. So we're, we're going to go really rapidly through the details. You've seen the AWS machine learning stack before. We support the GPU that are provided by NVIDIA Volta uh, V100, so the fastest GPU in the world, all the frameworks that are available. And then as of a couple of days ago, SageMaker was augmented with ground truth data labeling capabilities, elastic inference, reinforcement learning, workflow and collaboration capabilities. So there's a lot that we make available there all of these is packaged behind an API that, again, enables AI-driven development. And just to accelerate again on the capabilities of SageMaker, as a reminder, you have a notebook instances environment that enables you to build models, to train and tune models, as well as deploying models in production. And the key call out here is that all of these are available within, again, the framework and integrated framework of cloud data lake solutions, uh, compliance and audit capabilities, pay as you go, and all the things that you know. Now, PyTorch. Uh, to approach the PyTorch experience, or the experience of a PyTorch developer and SageMaker, I want to walk you through the concept that I call the anatomy of a deep learning framework of Sa on SageMaker. And the experience of a PyTorch developer or a developer in general usually starts with the developer working on either their laptop or the Jupyter Notebook. And for that, I'm actually going to switch to my laptop to um, get, the, get the workload started. OK. OK, I'm going to get back to the presentation and move back to sharing my screen when it's possible. So uh, as a developer, you get started with, uh, with your laptop or Jupyter Notebook environment. And when the experience with SageMaker starts like this, well, you, you have control over part of the infrastructure, some of the infrastructure. You can either kick off Jupyter Notebooks or training environment or hosting environment. And that control is augmented by capabilities like um, uh, SageMaker, uh, identi sorry, AWS Identity and Access Management that would enable you to basically have access controls in, in their environment. 
Um, and then you would be able to encrypt data and then uh, the, the EBS drives and everything data at rest and in transit using uh, the key management service of AWS. Now, all of that work together with Amazon S3 to provide data in, in, and the model artifacts to, to the model. The other piece of the equation is Amazon ECR. That makes it possible for us to package algorithms in different Docker containers for the workload that you have to run through. One of them is PyTorch, the other ones are TensorFlow, MXNet Chainer, and it's also possible for you to bring your own algorithm within this ecosystem. Now, the other thing that is important is the logs, because we don't want the developers to have to run machines all the time or after the workloads are done, it's possible for us to essentially externalize the logs back to CloudWatch logs and make sure that we shut down the infrastructure after the workload is done. Now, I believe you're familiar with the Jupyter Notebooks experience. It's an EC2 machine that we spin up for you, and then we put sample notebooks in there to practice. Uh, and then for the training ecosystem, we spin up an ephemeral cluster that comes attached with an EBS volume, and then we fetch the data automatically from the cloud storage into that training environment with the possibility of streaming that data indirectly, bypassing the, the EBS volume there and walk, taking the data directly to, to the instances for training. Now, the other thing that, are, that is important is the hosting experience. So with a few clicks, you can essentially host your uh, machine learning models behind the REST endpoint that is managed by SageMaker or behind the batch, inference, uh, batch transformation endpoint that is also managed by SageMaker. Now, what happens uh, for when, when you want to consume your models? Well, it's possible, again, within the SageMaker environment to using AWS Lambda and API Gateway communicate with that REST endpoint that you've made available for, to, for serving your models. Now let's dig a little bit into the Docker containers that we pull in in order to train your machine learning models. If you want to look at it from bottom up as far as the stack is concerned, within that container we have a data agent which has the responsibility to essentially go fetch the data, shard the data, distribute the data to multiple machines and bring that to the, to the cluster. There's also a log metrics agent, which also has a responsibility to collect the logs from every machines that are involved in the training process and then push those to the CloudWatch logs metric. And then when you go slightly higher up the stack, you get the possibility to distribute your training jobs depending on the frameworks that, that, is, um, that you're leveraging. And also you have the possibility to have CUDA libraries in case you're using GPUs. Going slightly higher up the stack, we get PyTorch libraries installed, whether you, if you're using a PyTorch container, we get TensorFlow installed if you're using a TensorFlow container, and so on and so forth. And then going again slightly higher up the stack, we get the Amazon SageMaker SDK, which is the most powerful item on this entire slide. The SageMaker SDK is that thing that makes it possible for us to do everything here. Fetch the data on your behalf, log the data on your behalf, um, you can summon SageMaker through the SDK and say, I want four, five, six machines, and we will figure out how to do everything else on your behalf. And way higher up the stack, we have your algorithm. And again, the algorithm could be an Amazon-provided algorithm, or it could be you bring your own algorithm in TensorFlow, but for that, for the, for the, in, in PyTorch, uh, for this specific case, but for that scenario, you wouldn't have to build all the distribution and everything else that happens within the container because we bring all of these capabilities. All you have to bring is your PyTorch script, and, and we'll walk through an example. Now, what happens when you do import SageMaker, when you essentially import the SDK within your working environment? If you remember that stack that we just walked through, uh, the, Python, the Python SDK does a few things. Well, first, you, you import SageMaker. For this specific case of PyTorch, um, we provide SageMaker to PyTorch that has a couple of classes. One is PyTorch and PyTorch model. Who here is familiar with scikit-learn? Okay, quite a number of people. So you can think about the PyTorch estimator in SageMaker as an analogy to scikit-learn, where we package a context class that has uh, the possibility to talk to the infrastructure, it has the possibility to fetch the PyTorch container, it has the possibility to hand over hyperparameters to your training job, and so that's how the developer communicates with SageMaker and communicates with the PyTorch environment. So that's essentially what happens here. As I create a PyTorch uh, estimator, and within that estimator, I point it to my main function, and then I say I want the MLP32 XLH, which, which is a GPU machine, and I, I tell the version of PyTorch that I want to use and the, the hyperparameters that I want to leverage. 
Now, the second thing is similar to scikit-learn. When you want to start training the model, you say PyTorchEstimator.fit, essentially asking SageMaker to go fetch the data using the data agent from S3, and you point it to these channels. So the, the content of this dictionary, essentially in this case, we have training, which is the pointer to the training data set on S3, and then we have test, which is the pointer to the test data set on S3. So in this case, SageMaker would know how to go fetch the data in these two uh, um, buckets, and it would know that the train one is for the purpose of training, and the test one is for the purpose of testing. So pretty straightforward. And once you're done training, you probably want to um, um, uh, host your model behind um, the endpoint. And it's extremely easy with SageMaker to essentially host your model. All you have to do is to use the PyTorch model class, point, uh, Sage, point the PyTorch model class to the location of the model itself on Amazon S3, and then give it some roles and all that for SageMaker to be able to uh, um, go fetch that data on your behalf. And then with six layers, D-E-P-L-O-I, it's possible for SageMaker to spin up an instance, in this case, three instances, and then host your model on your behalf and expose that behind the REST API. Now, in that training example, we had three machines involved in the training process, and what does that look like specifically? Well, when you have three machines that SageMaker spins up on your behalf, all of them have the same stack again that we walked through, from the data agent to the log metrics. And the first thing that happens is that the data agents in all of these machines go to fetch the data from the cloud storage. Again, SageMaker knows how to shard the data and distribute that to all the machines. So in this case, one third of the data would go to one machine if that's what you decide. Or it's also possible for SageMaker to take the entire data set and hand that over to all the machines that are involved in the process. Now, once the data are fetched by the data agent, they're placed under these folders, opt, ML, input, data, train, and test, because again, we pointed it to two uh, uh, training folders. Now, what you have to do as a PyTorch developer is to know that from your code, you have to go fetch the training data in these folders. And so our responsibility is to go get it from S3, put it here. Your responsibility is to get it from here and use it in your code. The next thing that happens is, in this scenario specifically, it's a distributed training um, exercise. And because it's a distributed training exercise, our PyTorch containers provide the distributed capabilities in PyTorch, um, distributed backend capabilities in PyTorch. One of them is NWCL, another one is Glow, there's TCP capability as well. The developers don't have to worry about that. So the SageMaker PyTorch um, uh, containers bring that and they make it possible for these machines to communicate during the distributed training process. And once the model is trained, SageMaker puts the model in optML model out, uh, uh, sorry, optML model, and then it, with the name of the model. In this case, it's a tabo. And after the model is put there, essentially what happens is SageMaker fetches the model and then puts that in the model artifacts um, uh, bucket. Now, if you have some outputs like images or anything that is generated by your model as you train it, the, there's also an optML output folder in which if you put information, SageMaker is going to fetch and push back to the cloud storage. So that's the responsibility of SageMaker in the process of training a distributed um, algorithm on the cloud. And uh, your responsibility is to know where these things are and fetch them and use them. Now, the log metrics uh, agent also, as you do train your model, it goes around and then fetches all the logs from all the machines, aggregates them, and pushes them back to the cloud storage so that you can, so to the CloudWatch logs. Uh, so that you can visualize your logs after the execution of a training job. Now, to go higher up the stack and talk specifically about PyTorch 1.0, what is the strategy there, and what are the benefits that the developers have there, it's my pleasure to introduce you, Jeff Smith from Facebook AI Research. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Jeff. I'm here from Facebook AI Research. Uh, I'm really happy that Amazon gave us the chance to come and tell a little bit of our story behind uh, why we built PyTorch and what we do with PyTorch at Facebook. Uh, so let me dive into that. So one of the th most important things we do with AI at Facebook is to make our existing products better. And so these are things like uh, social recommendations, asking your friends um, what exactly, uh, you know, searching for a restaurant or something like that. Um, so you can see an example of something like that, uh, so that to be able to work with that sort of data set of your friends. Uh, there's other interesting applications. One of them is I really like, which I will uh, point to later, is machine translation. 
Um, people all around the world use Facebook. This is one that I use on a, on a, on a nearly days, daily basis. Uh, we use machine translation as a way of uh, using deep learning models to be able to allow people to talk to each other who don't speak the same language. Uh, accessibility is another application which, uh, depending on your personal background, you may not have seen before, uh, but is a really powerful use of deep learning to render all of this rich user content that we have across things like Facebook and Instagram accessible to people uh, who have different abilities. And we do this with, uh, with PyTorch. It's not just uh, the good parts of, of applications, though, that uh, AI helps us with. It's also the difficult stuff, the protection of the community, the integrity of your experience. Uh, as a Facebook, Instagram user. And so this is preventing things like share baiting, uh, as you see there, uh, and even uh, suicide prevention detection. Um, so these are really important applications that we're investing a lot in internally uh, across the board to be able to make sure that uh, our platform is used in a way that really benefits uh, you, the users, the most, as, as much as possible. And deep learning plays a really key role in that, as powered by PyTorch. Yeah. Okay. So. There we go. Uh, we do this at an extraordinary scale today. Uh, so PyTorch today is our end-to-end -end research to production platform, uh, performing 300 trillion inference operations a day. Um, we also run all of this code on mobile devices. So the, the technology you're going to see today is actually deployed on over a billion uh, mobile devices. And so there are a lot of unique challenges that come from operating at that scale uh, on servers and in mobile devices. And so it takes a fairly unique approach to technology to develop the tool chain that allows people to be successful in doing things like that. So our choice for this is PyTorch. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on what is PyTorch. Um, the first thing I want to point out is that uh, PyTorch has, has gotten really popular here. Um, and so we've seen uh, this big uptick in contributors on, on GitHub. Uh, we have now uh, become the second fastest growing project in all of open source on GitHub. Uh, which is really exciting to see. So it's been this really great community success story in which we've developed an open source AI framework in collaboration uh, with everyone in the community. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, here are some of the places you might start to touch it if you, as a user. These are just APIs that allow you to do various things, uh, like, have, uh, like use specific optimizers. Uh, and this is just kind of a sampling of, of some of the utilities that come out of the box that are really easy to use. I'll show you them kind of in action, which makes it a little bit clearer. OK, uh, so the, the first example here, uh, to be clear, uh, we have now two APIs across uh, Python and C++. We're showing them both here just to show that they're, they're very similar in their structure. And so your use of them really just depends upon uh, what suits your application the best. Uh, here, we're showing an example of, of some of the, the out-of-the-box functionality you get. Module is our way of defining a neural network layer. Uh, and, then you, and then I'm going to show you a few more functions you can get. So you get things like dropout, uh, nonlinear functions right out of the box. Uh, here's some example of a few more things. Uh, so we have, uh, we have like uh, data loaders from, uh, from Torch Vision, which allow us to get example data sets and things like that. Uh, and again, the Python and C++ are very similar. And they're, they're very idiomatic to both of their languages uh, that we're trying to uh, really work with you as a developer in the way that you're going to program to begin with. I want to talk about the journey of research to production because this is really what makes or breaks uh, AI technology today because AI is a very old topic, but it's a fairly new topic within production. Uh, and this is an area that I personally spent a lot of time in my career on, and I'm really excited at the solutions we've been able to develop. Uh, so I want to tell you the story of what is research to production uh, at Facebook. And so this is kind of a, this is a snapshot from maybe, say, the past year or so. So we have these three different uh, unique technologies that have their own capabilities. Um, there we, mm -hmm. there we go. Okay. There we go. Okay. All right. So, uh, PyTorch historically was used for prototyping. It grew out of Facebook AI research and was really focused on the experience of AI researchers trying to develop papers, but not necessarily to deploy to production. Onyx uh, is the open neural network exchange format, uh, which we developed in collaboration with a number of large companies within the uh, larger tech industry to allow us to have interoperation between deep learning frameworks. Uh, its real focus is on being able to transfer neural network models from this uh, research mode into production. And then finally, historically, we developed a different deep learning framework called CAFE2, uh, which was really optimized to be able to execute on that uh, trillions of inference operations uh, a day 
uh, mission that we have organizationally. This is great, uh, but we want to make it smoother. We want to put less work in there. We want to have this really smooth transition uh, from prototyping all the way out to deployment, and that is what PyTorch 1.0 is all about. So what is PyTorch 1.0? It's a seamless path from research to production. We want to make sure that whatever you can do in research, you can deploy uh, with the least friction possible. And so we have a lot of tools for this. Uh, part of this is, is allowing you to really opt in and decide uh, when you want flexibility and when you uh, want to be concerned with uh, having the sort of static assumptions that we have in a production mode. Uh, but to be able to have a tool chain that doesn't require you to make substantial changes just because you've decided, okay, this model is good, I want to ship it. Uh, when we talk about productionization, uh, this is really the area, I think, that uh, of AI technology where people have really uh, only recently started to develop very powerful and useful solutions. Um, as, a, as an engineer and an engineering manager, this is one of the biggest rate limiters I have seen on, on a large number of teams I've been on. So when we talk about productionization, there are things we need to do. To be able to operate at Facebook scale, you need to use your hardware really efficiently uh, because uh, we, we need to do so much uh, inference operations. Uh, training jobs are enormous, uh, which means that we also need to be able to do that quite scalably. We need to be able to address large clusters of GPUs, and we need, able, need to be able to go uh, across a range of devices, CPUs, GPUs, mobile devices. Another thing that we'll want to be able to do is to be able to optimize our code. Uh, the solution within PyTorch 1.0 is this really unique and powerful technology, uh, which we call the JIT. Uh, the JIT allows us to be able to take this flexible experimental mode and adapt it for production use cases, uh, either incrementally or as a whole program. What we're talking about is this difference between eager and uh, static mode within deep learning frameworks in general. Classic PyTorch has really focused on this eager mode where depending on how you're running your program, maybe you actually just want to see the result right now, or maybe you want to be able to export a graph and using Onyx or something like that to be able to optimize it later. Static graph uh, deep learning frameworks uh, like CAFE2 have this sort of assumption that you're going to run your program just to produce a graph and that graph itself is going to be executed uh, to produce your result. Intrinsic conflict between these two, there's some uh, pros and cons. Obviously, people like flexibility in research. It allows them to pursue the development of new ideas, uh, but it's really hard to ship because we can't uh, do things like optimization to run it efficiently. Uh, on the uh, static side of this chart, uh, of course, this gives us the ability to optimize to run efficiently, um, but this gets in the way of your development workflow when you're really in that early research stage. So what we've done is we've taken classic PyTorch that a lot of people know and love, that is simple and debuggable and is straight Python as you know it, and we now call that the PyTorch eager mode. Uh, it, again, its main uh, negative is that it, we can't optimize it for production, and for a lot of use cases, uh, some users can't uh, deploy uh, with, a, with a Python runtime environment. So uh, that's eager mode. We now have script mode. Uh, what can you do with script mode? Well, script mode allows you to extract out uh, what is the graph from your flexible uh, PyTorch program and be able to optimize it for efficient execution uh, using the JIT compiler. Uh, there's two ways to do this. Uh, one is that you can do this uh, in a tracing mode that allows you to perform an execution of your program to get its uh, structure. So if you have no conditional logic within uh, your entire deep learning framework, so your entire deep learning program, uh, you can actually just run it through once and then you'll get this, uh, this static representation that you can execute then on a, in, in a way that can be highly optimized. Or you can move incrementally, uh, taking things function by function, giving you that sort of incremental adaptation of research to production. And all this is, is opt-in at the level of, of simple uh, annotations. A way that you can dive into precisely how we use uh, technology like this today is to use our FairSeq implementation. FairSeq is, uh, is the framework that we developed uh, to perform the six billion uh, neural machine translations we perform on a daily basis. Uh, it's really leading research technology that is actually deployed uh, at extraordinary scale today, uh, making people happy uh, all across Facebook. And you can use it on a specially optimized uh, uh, version of the project, which you can find on this GitHub project, and you can get it, uh, and you can understand how you can use it on SageMaker today. And with that, I'm going to pass back to Dan. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks. So to recap, um, SageMaker provides the end-to-end -end machine learning platform capabilities. Um, it can 
dance at the same rhythm as the developer to basically get to AI-driven development. And PyTorch provides all the APIs and all the capabilities from a deep learning standpoint that can take the developer from research to production in a seamless manner. Um, and Facebook and Amazon work together to implement FASIC, which is basically um, a Facebook AI research sequence to sequence um, library on top of AWS Sage, Amazon SageMaker. So it's possible for you to play around with it right now. Now, we're going to switch to the demo. And essentially, for the demo, we will, I, would, I will walk you through a practical aspect of what Jeff just described for all of us. So we will, who here is familiar with uh, generative adversarial networks? A few people, OK. So GANs are essentially um, generative adversarial networks were invented by Ian Goodfellow. And it's a, it's a mechanism through which you can basically train two networks, two neural networks, to work against each other um, for good at the end of the day. Uh, in this specific example of DC GAN, what um, we are going to implement is a neural network that is striving to generate fake images, um, and a neural network that is striving to basically discriminate and correct those fake images, as, the, as in finding out whether these images are fake or real. So the idea there and the intuition there is that you, you want to be able at the end of the day to generate net new images from random noise. And as that generator generates net new images, you also have a trained discriminator that is, trained, that is basically classifying these images as, as fake or, or real. And you train them together. And the benefit there is that, that the point of equilibrium is where the discriminator is almost at a coin, at a, at a coin toss, as in 50-50, where it's not certain whether an image is, is, uh, is real or not. Because it starts very high in confidence because it was trained on recognizing real images. And it ends up as, I'm not sure anymore. And by that time, you've basically trained a generator to give you some images that, has, that are as real as possible. Now, in the images domain, it's, it's a pretty fun example. And it's very visual. So that's why we selected that for the demo. But you can extrapolate that concept and basically train threat detection models with a threat detection discriminator and a threat detection generator. Uh, you can train fraud detection models. You can train all sorts of different type of models with that type of mindset. So that's why we selected that for, for the demo. And now I'm going to switch to, um, to my laptop to walk you through some of the details. So, the first thing is the, we will walk through some code. And the first thing that I want to call out is I'm using my own laptop to do SageMaker specific development, right? And again, that's all thanks to the SageMaker Python SDK. So the SageMaker Python SDK is pip installable. You can have that on your own laptop. And that, what that makes possible is for you to basically use SageMaker on your own laptop or use SageMaker on the Jupyter Notebook instance on the cloud, whichever one works for you. I guess we should start by the Jupyter Notebook. So the SageMaker console looks like this. And then if you go to the notebook, and as of a couple of days ago, we have all of these other capabilities that are available. Um, but if you do create a Jupyter Notebook instance, um, it's very easy to just open the notebook here. And I've already done that. And then I would land into my, my own Jupyter Notebook folder with, um, with my SageMaker DCGAN example. Now, the structure of this example, and which again is available on GitHub, is well, I have a notebook um, to basically walk through some of, in an exploratory manner, to some of the, the things that I want to play with, right? So I'm showing you the notebook now because it, it helps me do some preview of the data. It, help, it helps me visualize my data on a subsample data set in order for me to know that I'm working with the proper uh, uh, data set that I need. But it's very straightforward. The idea here is to, to load the data, to get a, a subset of the data locally and then use that to explore your data set at a very, at a very low scale um, uh, level. Now, so I just want to point out that the experience is possible on Jupyter Notebook instance or SageMaker. The next call out that I have is when you do execute on SageMaker, you have this concept called local mode. Now, SageMaker local mode makes it possible for developers to um, essentially kick off a SageMaker job using the SageMaker SDK and the SageMaker syntax but leveraging Docker containers on their local machines for testing. So what that makes possible is you're using the same syntax and semantics, and you're kicking off a job locally. 
you can clean up your code, you can remove some errors and all these things that can typically go through. Um, but by the time you're done with that, it's very easy for you to extrapolate and push the same piece of code to SageMaker and train to a larger instance, 10 instances, 20, 20 instances if you want. Now, I'll start by working you through the, the, what you need to do to execute, as in you, assuming you already have your neural network, we'll get into that, but assuming you already have that and you want to kick off a job with SageMaker, this is what the code looks like. It's very straightforward. So essentially, I do import SageMaker, and I import some extra libraries that can basically help me visualize my data. This is the essence of SageMaker local mode. Um, this role is basically my SageMaker role that enables SageMaker to do things on AWS on my behalf. I put it in my environment variables because I'm sharing the code on GitHub, and I don't want you to run things in my account. So uh, that's why it's there. But so you will have your own role there. And in this instance type variable, I'm keeping, I'm keeping two versions of it, whether I want to submit the job to SageMaker or I want to submit the job lo locally. So in the case I want to submit the job locally, I, I say I want to use the local mode, and, um, and I, I point SageMaker to my input data set. In this case, I have the, the face data set in my, in my S3 bucket, and this is what we, we went through slightly earlier. Now, you create this estimator object, which again is like a Spark context in Spark, if you're familiar with it, or is the scikit-learn estimator, and you point it to your entry point. The entry point is the main function, is a function that, you, that is actually executing the training process of your training job. The other thing that the estimator object is expecting from you is the source directory. Now, the source directory is very important because sometimes your code has helper libraries, has utility libraries, has dependencies. So all of these dependencies, you can put them in the source directory, and then SageMaker is going to fetch that and put that on every container, Docker container, as it spins up the job for you. Now, the next thing is the role and the framework version. Now, when you say I want the framework version 1.0.0.1 dev, because you're using the PyTorch estimator, SageMaker knows to go get PyTorch 1.0 and make it available to you. Uh, if you said you wanted ver framework version 0.4.0, SageMaker would create a container with PyTorch 0.4.0 for you. And in this case, I say I want two instances, and then this is an instance type that I want. Now, here the instance type is local. What we're going to do is that we're going to change that to uh, MLP316 extra large, which is a GPU-based instance running on, 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 on SageMaker. Now, the next thing that I need to specify is the hyperparameters. Here I say, well, because it's the demo, I say I want to run, I already ran it for a longer period of time, but I say I want to run it for two epochs, and this is a distributed backend that I want to use. And for selecting a distribution backend, you can say you want Glow, you want NWCL, you want TCP, depending on how you want to distribute your workload, but you don't have to, again, install and configure it. SageMaker does it. Uh, by default. Here I can change my backend to Glow and AWCL and you can, uh, you can compare the performances there. Now this display after is basically um, uh, a hyperparameter that I use in my code to display the pictures because again, I'm generating pictures as part of this exercise. So I want to be able to see these pictures as I go through my, my development. And this specifically, and one of the reasons I selected this example is because again, in some cases you might be training a deep neural network and at the end of the training of a deep neural network, you might want to have a conversation with your team, with your management and all these things. So you, my advice for you is to think about displaying some of your results, creating new metrics, and I'll show you some of the code to basically um, measure the amount of time it takes for you to fetch the data, the amount of time it takes for an iteration, the amount of time it takes with a batch. All of these things, you can point them out to SageMaker, um, and then basically it will be able to from where you stored it in the output folder, pick that up and put it back on S3 for you so that you could review that later on. Now, the number of workers is basically, it's taken by the training data loader that Jeff spoke about, and it's a way to hyper-thread the mechanism through which you can fetch the data from the data loader. And I specify my batch size and the base job name. Now, the cool thing about running SageMaker, um, uh, kicking off a job with SageMaker when I do the estimator fit is that I have this weight um, parameter. Now, if I say weight is equal to true, what is going to happen is that my laptop is going to ask SageMaker to start a job, go to S3 and fetch that data, uh, give it that infrastructure, 
and get the job started. But because I said weight is equal to true, the log metrics agent is going to go and fetch logs from all of these machines that are contributing in the job and then present them back to me or my client. And my client could have been my, could have been my Jupyter Notebook as well. So we're going to get this started. What, and then I'm going to get into describing the actual PyTorch code. Now, the job is starting. Can you see, can you see correctly? Yeah, so SageMaker is starting the training job. The other important thing that I wanted to call out, some folks asked me, um, so what about my own library? What if I wanted to install TensorBoard? In this specific case, for example, I'm using TensorBoard to present the metrics, the custom metrics that I've generated, as well as uh, some of the images that I'm generating on the fly, because I want to visualize those fake images that were created through time. And so you can have these requirements as text file, basically part of your source directory. In this case, in my source directory, I have these requirements of text file. And in your requirement of text file, whatever library you put in there, as long as it's pip installable, SageMaker will pick that up and install it for you. So this is very powerful in the sense that you can start a job with PyTorch and SageMaker, but if you have dependencies and extra libraries, like an NLP library that you want to use, or like, um, like TensorBoard, or like anything else that you want to use that we don't provide by default, just by putting that in the requirements of text file, SageMaker will be able to find that requirement of text file, take the libraries, install the libraries in every container before it starts training your job. So again, that's the relationship between you, SageMaker, and, and the framework. So while it's starting the instances, I'm going to walk you through the actual GAN code for PyTorch. Now we, we work through the launch code, which is basically the execution code for, for the main function. The structure of my the structure of my source directory is, is like this. So I have my main function, which basically runs the, the training loop. But before I get there, I want to start by the actual neural network function. So I keep my neural network definitions in one file, and then I keep my main function in another file. Now, the neural network definitions file is very straightforward. That's exactly what Jeff showed you earlier. Uh, PyTorch makes it very easy for you to, dis to describe your neural network using the simple APIs that, that, uh, that Jeff introduced you to. Now, to create my generator, I use the NN module uh, class that, that Jeff um, told, uh, told us about, which basically makes it possible for you to declare your neural network in a, in a decorative way. Now, it provides simple APIs to, to create linear layers, to create convolutional layers, to create LSTM layers, and in a parameterized way so that you don't have to do a lot of uh, writing code. Now, when you do create these layers with an NN module, module, it does other things in the back end, other things like identifying what kind of parameters are involved in those layers, identifying whether these parameters need their gradients computed, identifying whether these weights are contributing to the loss function that you want to optimize, and then keeping track of these gradients so that when you do your back propagation step, um, it will be able to update these gradients on your behalf. So all of that is seamless to the end user, and PyTorch makes it a lot easier for you to just declaratively um, declare your neural network. It also has this sequential uh, class that basically makes it possible for you to stack your declarations of your neural network. In this case, uh, for my generator, because the generator starts with a vector of basically noise, a 100-dimensional vector of nothing, random noise, and from there, it tries to create an image, something in the shape of an image. So it does uh, transpose convolution in two dimensions to, to go from a one-dimensional vector back to the shape of an image. And for that, it, it uses the number of channels that you provide because we're using color images and, and, and other parameters. So that's what's going on here. The code is available on GitHub, so you can, you can read the details. And this part of the, um, of the initialization class of the generator is concerned with instantiating the, the weight of that generator. Again, there are helper libraries for you to either randomly instantiate the weights of that neural network, of that part of a neural network, or instantiate the weights with a normal distribution uh, uh, centered at zero in standard deviation of 0 0.2, for, 0 0.02, for example. Right. Okay, so the other important thing when you're creating a neural network, uh, when you're declaring a neural network with, uh, 
with PyTorch is the forward function. Now the forward function is designed to pass your data through the, the, through the neural network architecture that you've created. Now this is important, okay, my, my trading job is actually starting already, by the way, so this is going on. I'll walk you through the logs in a minute. So the forward function is important in the sense that it's what takes your, your actual data and passes it through the neural network. Now, you might observe here that there is no backward function that you have to create. The backward function is, is responsible for after the data is passed through the neural network and it gets to the end and it's, it's basically evaluated by the loss function, then you need to, base, to essentially penalize all the weights in the, in the neural network for their contribution on, on, the, on the loss function. So for that, you use backpropagation, which applies the chain rule all the way up from the loss function back to every single weight that contributed in that execution. And so that backpropagation is a lot of differential equations that you typically have to do yourself. You have to track all the weights, and some neural networks can get very, very, very big, big all the way up until billions of parameters. So PyTorch seamlessly keep these parameters and this tracked relationship between all the weights that are contributing to the outcome. And when you, when you use the backward function in your, in, 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 in PyTorch, it tr does backpropagation and tracks the weight for you automatically. So backward fu the backward function is provided by the autograd um, package in PyTorch. You don't have to implement it yourself. So we've done the same for the discriminator, which basically does the opposite of the generator. The generator does transpose convolution to create an image. The discriminator go does normal convolution to identify the objects in the image and classify that at the end with a sigmoid activation function, which is essentially a binary, um, a binary logic function that says, well, it, 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 um, it computes the probability between zero and one that that says how, how much it believes that that image is real or fake, right? So this, if you're familiar with object detection and object classifications, it's pretty much the same thing. That's what a discriminator is doing. And you could also initialize that here, and it has a forward function. That's pretty much it. So this is a structure of a neural network that does something as complex as, um, as generator, ge generative adversarial networks. Now, the other thing that you, that you have to do now is your main function. So you have declared your neural network. Uh, you need now to use it to fetch the data, to pass the data through your model, uh, to train your mini batches, and to do everything else that you need to do now. Specifically, the point I want to hit here is the operational aspect of training neural network or training models. I, I spoke to you earlier about using TensorBoard to log metrics. Now, Besides importing all the other PyTorch libraries, it's very important to, here we go, okay. So this TensorBoard X library makes it possible for you to use TensorBoard with PyTorch, all right? It was part of my requirements of text file installables, so you would be familiar with everything PyTorch related up there because it's common already, but I installed TensorBoard X to be able to write logs of any kind that I want to TensorBoard during my execution. So that's what I do here. I import TensorBoard X. It gives me access to this summary writer. And I have this TensorBoard log directory that I put, that I, that I pass to the summary writer to create a writer that I will use to write images, logs, and everything else. Now, the interesting thing that I want to call out here as it relates to SageMaker, remember when I told you that SageMaker knows where to put things for you, you, know, you need to know where to put things for SageMaker. This is one of these examples. A sister SDK to the SageMaker SDK is called the SageMaker Containers. If you don't have it installed, install it. What the SageMaker Containers does is it provides you with a lot of environment variables that are already available in SageMaker. One of these environment variables is the output data there. So the output data there is essentially the environment variable for where SageMaker is expecting you to put some of your output that it's going to fetch and go pre uh, uh, put on, on, on S3 on your behalf. So that's what I've done here. I'm creating my summary writer and I'm pointing that to this output data directory and I'm naming my folder runs. And that's where I'm going to have my TensorBoard metrics. Now, the rest of it is, well, there's a, Help a function to load the to load the generator and instantiate instantiate that uh, to load the discriminator and instantiate that as well, and there starts my training function. Now, 
I commented the training functions so that you could read the code on GitHub and get through the details. We don't have all the time to go through all of that. But the important, po the important points to, to call out are, how do, how do I know, because, or how do I create my script in such a way that I can use it, regardless of whether I'm using a CPU or a GPU, regardless of whether I have multiple GPUs or not. So I want to have my code to be agnostic to all of these possible changes in infrastructure whenever I want to kick off a SageMaker training job. And that's basically what is happening here. So I'm checking um, part of the arguments that SageMaker provides to me are the number of hosts that I have. Again, I don't need to figure that out. Because if I, if I kick off a job with two or three or four hosts, SageMaker is going to pass that to me as part of a, the argument to my main function training job. So I can use that information and say, hey, um, if the number of the hosts that you've created for me um, is more than one, and there is this parameter for distributed backend, uh, and it's not known, well, I, I believe I want a distributed training job. And so if I have a distributed training job, do all of these things. So this is, if you're a PyTorch developer, you're probably familiar with this. To distribute a training job in PyTorch, you, you, you essentially need to have a view of your world or your world size. Machines have different ranks within that world size, and that's how they can distribute the work among themselves, uh, distribute the data, the logs, and all these things. Um, so, and that's what I'm doing here. So I'm, get, I'm grabbing the environment variables, I'm grabbing the host rank of, of my machine, and then I'm instantiating my, my distributed, uh, PyTorch distributed func uh, class to, with, with that backend that was, that was provided by me and with the host rank that, is, that, that this machine has. Now, this specific machine, because you have a copy of the script on multiple machines, every single one of them has a rank in the, in the world of machines that you have. And what SageMaker does is if it starts three or four or five machines, it would basically give them different ranks. And if you read the rank from the environment variable, um, then you will be each machine, even though the script is the same in all the machine, each machine will be instantiated with its own host rank. I hope it makes sense so far. If it makes sense, say yes. All right, perfect. Yes, I'm not talking to myself. Okay, so, so then the next thing, you know, you've, you've, you've instantiated, you, you loaded your model, um, you found out agnostically if you are, um, code is, if your workload is distributed or not, if GPUs are supposed to be used or not. And the next thing to, actually, no, this, this is how you find out whether you have GPUs or not. So if PyTorch provides this Torch, a CUDA is available as a, as a feature. And this Torch CUDA is available, essentially gives you an output of true or false if you have GPUs available or not. And so I can leverage that and create this device uh, uh, variable that to which I'm going to push all my tensors and all my neural networks and everything else. If you've used PyTorch before, uh, before PyTorch 1.0, to pass your tensors to, to GPUs was, uh, it was challenging. So PyTorch 1.0 makes it a lot easier to point all the tensors, all the network structures and everything else to a specific device and you only set that up once and you can, you can use that for going on for it. Now the next thing I need to do is to load my data and I have a helper function to essentially create my data loader. You can read that in the utilities um, um, file. And I load my model which returns a generator and a discriminator which is what we are returning here in the load model function. And PyTorch also has this Torch CUDA device count. So Torch CUDA device count is essentially returning the number of GPUs that exist on that machine. So again, you can use this function to find out if you have more than one GPUs on the machine. And if you have more than one GPUs on the machine, then you can use all of these GPUs that you have on the machine. So yeah, if you have more than one GPUs on the machine, PyTorch provides, the NN module has this data parallel uh, class, which is a wrapper around your normal uh, NN module class, but now that it knows that you have multiple GPUs in the machine, it's going to parallelize the data to all of these GPUs. Again, something you don't have to worry about. The only thing you have to do is find out if you have more than one GPUs and push that to, um, to all of these GPUs using data parallel. 
And the way you push all of these to the GPUs is by saying generator to device, discriminator to device, and your device is true, um, it's GPU if you're using GPU, CPU if you're using CPU, and you find that agnostically using this function. Again, the beauty of this is whether you're on CPU or on GPU, this will work agnostically. The next, the next thing to do is to create your, your loss function. Um, and PyTorch provide, again, with the NN module, the multiple loss function. In the case of the, of the generative battery serial network, we're using the binary, binary cross entropy loss, which is essentially computing a, a cross entropy across multiple um, uh, different values or different variables. In this case, we have two outputs that we care about, fake or not fake. So the, the BCE computes the likelihood of something being fake or something not being fake and gives you a probability between zero and one. The next thing is the optimizer. And all of these, I, I hope you can see how sequential programming with PyTorch can be as opposed to other framework where you have to create a graph in something and then push that. PyTorch makes it possible for you to, in a sequential manner, describe your neural network, your data loader, and everything step by step. And the next thing you have to do here is, is to uh, instantiate an optimizer. An optimizer is also provided by the torch.optim library. And there are many optimizers, IRMS Prop and Adam and all these other guys. Now, here we're using the, the Adam optimizer. I'm using an optimizer for each neural piece of the neural network, the generator or the discriminator. And the way it knows to work with that piece of a neural network is because I'm passing the discriminator.parameters to the discriminator optimizer and the generator.parameters to the generator optimizer. Now, fast forward, there's some helper libraries here to print the logs, the average log, the, the average logs, um, the average meter, the average time it took me to load the data, to run through a batch, and all these other things. Um, now, the other important thing here is the training loop. The training loop is where you're actually training your data, where you're actually training your model. And so with my training loop, I'm, I'm, I'm essentially um, tracking the time it takes me to, to update, I'm sorry, tracking the time it takes me to load the data. Um, I can also uh, pass the real faces, which is a, a tensor with the actual real images to the GPU. I have to do that for every data set that I have because I'm using the GPU. I set the, the batch size to, the, the data is loaded in batches, so I want to pick up that batch size. And everything else that follows is to essentially pass the data through the neural network, do the forward propagation, uh, compute the loss, and then do the backward propagation and iterate through that over and over. So you can read the, the details there. I commented the, the logic about the loss function here so that you can read that later. And scrolling down to the next part that matters is writing the log. So because I have that writer, with that writer that I created, I can essentially write all these values that I care about. And I encourage you to be creative about what you want to write. If you want to track anything, you can put it here. So I'm, I'm tracking average time to load the batch, average time to do a decent number of other things. Now, if my display after, um, if my, if my display after parameter was set to 200, so after 200 iterations, I want to see a new image. That's essentially what I'm doing here. So after 200 iterations, I want to print the logs to, to, the, to standard out. And when you print to standard out, SageMaker picks that up and sends it to your logs. And um, I also want to visualize some of these images. And that's what I use here with a view till save image and save image and writer add image. So save image will save an image to a folder that I, will, that I will upload for myself. And write image is going to write the images to TensorBoard. And that's pretty much it. The rest of it is, um, is to do some plotting and saving the model, which is pretty straightforward. And I run the main function. Now let's look at the logs of running the main function that we started earlier. Like I told you earlier, SageMaker would install the libraries on your behalf. So that's what happened here. It starts, this collecting TensorBoard, this SageMaker finding TensorBoard in my requirements, a text file, and installing, installing it for me on different machines. Now, it's kicking off the training job, giving me some of the parameters. And I made it, I made it run for just two epochs so that we won't stare at the logs training for forever. 
So, and then it starts plotting, I mean, it starts reporting the logs and everything else that you're probably familiar with if you trained a neural network before. So that's pretty much the experience there. Now, going back to the console, if I go back to SageMaker training jobs, I can see the training job that we just executed, this one. And if I go to the details there, SageMaker will give me the metadata, it will give me information about the output. Uh, and if I go to this output folder, then it pushed my model there, and it also pushed the information, all the information that I, was, that I stored in, in, in those images and, and everything else that is related. Uh, the other interesting thing that I wanted to show you is the logs that the log metrics has pushed to, to CloudWatch logs. So here I can visualize GPU utilization, CPU utilization. Uh, I can also the same logs in case I wanted to wait for the logs that were presenting to my, presented to my laptop are also sent to to SageMaker, and these are the logs for multiple jobs that I've executed through time. So forever, you can see your logs afterwards. And um, TensorBoard, uh, all the metrics that I pushed to TensorBoard are visible afterwards, right? So the average batch time that I was tracking, the, the loss for the discriminator, the loss for the generator, all of these things are available for, for you to visualize afterwards. And the images as well, are available. So because I push the images after each iteration, it's possible for me to visualize how the network through time, the generator through time, has been trying to generate uh, through, yeah, has been trying to generate fake images. Like initially, it's really, really dirty and really random. And as you go forward, it becomes clearer and clearer. And I didn't wait enough for it to start generating images that look as real as possible. Um, and then you can also plot that against the real images. So that's that. And the last thing before we call it a day, all the files that I was saving um, in the output data directory after each epoch, SageMaker would fetch them up and then push them to the cloud storage. So I've already downloaded that from a previous execution. So this is really good if you want to have a conversation with your team after this are the, the image at epoch number 25 or whatever, you can come and pick them up from here. Um, and you also have the real, no, these are still the fake images, and you also have the, yeah, all of these fake images, and you also have the, uh, the loss function that you can plot after every epoch, right? And you can visualize that and have a conversation around that afterwards. Um, the other interesting thing that's available there is, I, I created a, a GIF or GIF, depending on how you pronounce that, for, for the loss of a generator and discriminator as part of the, one of the helper functions that's available there. So again, you can, you can use that to do some plotting internally, create some animation, and then after you push everything, it's going to be available. In this case, you see the generator starts with a high error, but over time, it's the error of the generator starts going down, and then if I had trained for long enough, you would have seen the discriminator meeting the generator somewhere halfway through to a position where, uh, to the equilibrium position. That would indicate that the generator has gotten a lot better at generating images, and the discriminator has, has gotten a lot worse at finding out whether these images are true or not. And I also created an animation for, for the results for you to be able to animate the epochs of everything uh, through time. Now, with that, I'm going to switch back to the slides and back to the, uh, the example code. Hopefully you took, you took a picture of that. And thank you. Thanks again for your time.